All right, welcome to Christian Bible Chapel. This is our Wednesday night Bible class, and we thank the Lord. We're still continuing um, our lesson on justification as we close out this chapter in justification. And we're dealing with what is Reformed theology as we go through the different chapters. And next week, we'll be looking at uh, chapter uh, 6, uh, the humanity's radical corruption dealing with the, uh, the acrostic tulip. We'll do that next week. Let's try and close out in justification. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of those that are present as well as those that we fought as means of the internet, Facebook, or YouTube. We thank you, Father, for their presence. And we pray that you look upon us as we search the scriptures. Uh, we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God will move upon the hearts of the listeners. If they're saved, to be drawn closer to you in the word of God. If they're not, that they'll be released from their works of righteousness, that they may turn to the righteousness of Christ, put faith and repentance in him. Allow your spirit to give us understanding in the reading of your word. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, our notes will be coming from R.C. Sproul, a book, What is Reformed Theology, if you want to uh, purchase it and get it, um, where you can now turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse... Uh, 25. Now, um, we see on the board here the meaning to the word justification. Now, you're probably wondering why we are dwelling so long on the subject matter of justification. Well, you see, the thing about justification is if you don't get that right, it is a high possibility, very high, that you have been deceived that you receive another gospel. Why do I say that? Because the justification is the heart of salvation. It's the heart of the gospel. The word itself means to be declared righteous. And you cannot be declared righteous by any form of works. Now, concerning our, uh, concerning our Roman Catholic friends, Pentecostal and many other religions and groups, denominations, any religion, any group, any denomination or church that teaches that you have to work or earn salvation, even an ounce of it, it is blasphemous, it, it is heresy, because salvation is strictly from God. It, God has to save you. Right? Now, you, you have listening long enough to know that we have to pull back in, in history to find out how that after all the centuries that the apostles, or all the work, excuse me, that the apostles and those that follow them put into and in presenting the true gospel, somehow by the time the uh, third century, which is 200 and something, 235 or whatever it may be, to 200, let's just say 200 all the way up, to 1500, the church has been plagued by heresy, errors, and false teaching concerning the gospel. Now make note of this. Your belief in church matters, church matters relating to righteous living, moral ethics, societal justice, moral standard, if your church, any church, right, uh, rejects the biblical teaching of justification by faith alone, how can such a church, how can such a system within the church, how can such a people or a person be truly saved? See, that's the anchor of justification, that it teaches you that you're saved by grace alone. Now, I got two statements on the board, and you that are, uh, you may want to look at it on Facebook or YouTube tonight when you get a chance. 
The two statements is this. Justification is objective. Now let me let me make a note on that while I'm thinking about it. Justification right, is a alien righteousness. Now why do I say that? Well, that's due to what uh, Martin Luther has said is alien. Now, alien is something that's without, it's outside our planet. If you say you saw it's an alien, that means it's out. So righteousness is an alien righteousness. It's outside of our reach. It's outside of us. We're not born with righteousness. We're not born with purity or sinlessness. Now, by the time the church was taken over, the visible church was taken over by the Roman Catholic Society in the year 313 all the way up to 1500. The church, the visible church, existed only as the Roman Catholic Church. And you had to go. You was commanded to go. And they had such teachings within that system. Even today, passed down today, you have to realize that through the Council of Trent and many other councils that they had, beginning at 1543 and 1965, and then 1994, the Council of Trent, even in our millennium, has sought to stick with that you cannot be justified by faith alone. You cannot. This is what they teach. And this is why I made the statement that if any church, any religion, any group upholds that you have to work any part in order to be saved, then that church is in error. That church is beyond error. It is heresy. It is blasphemous. They are blaspheming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, they're blaspheming the, the true gospel. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, as well as many other churches, Pentecostal, any Pentecostal church, any Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, whatever denomination that tells you that you have to do something, work or earn. See, even coming to the altar is a work, is a form of work. Yes, saying the sinner's prayer of repentance is a work. It's a work. It's, it's, it may seem small but and insignificant, but it's still a work. You can't, you can't do anything but admit to God that you are a sinner deserving his righteous judgment, all right? And to spend eternity in death, you have to admit that. You have to admit that God sent his son to die on the cross for sinners and that he was buried and he rose again the third day. Any, doc, any, any, teaching, any teaching from any of the denomination, religion, or religious system that says that you have to work any ounce of, of works it makes it it boards it boards out faith. Now, this is the reason why God moved upon certain individuals in the 15th, 16th century, which was 15 something, with Martin Luther, Thomas Kramer, and and um, many others at that particular time, even earlier, you know, uh, Jerome and many others. Who, whom God moved upon to reestablish, to reform the church back to its status as he left it with the apostles. Okay, with the apostles. And it's a prime shame that that had happened. But nevertheless, the scripture says, upon this rock I build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Nothing will block Christ or destroy the true church. Now, 
the visible church can be corrupt. The visible church can err. The visible church can fall into heresy. The visible church can split, divide, and argue, and fuss, and even fight. But the true church, which is made up of every believer in Christ, it cannot be halted because God is the one that has to say. So in the in, in, in this statement here, I say this. <coughs> justification is objective. <coughs> Now, the reason why I said objective is because of the phrase alien righteousness. It's, it's, it's objective because you, we as sinners, have no part in it in order to be saved. Justification is, object, is the objective act of God whereby he alone declares a sinner righteous by means of the complete work of Christ. Now, for you that are truly saved, that sounds biblical. But to those that are not, it still sounds biblical. See, this is the reason why you have to, when you're witnessing out there, and you approach a person and ask them, are they saved, are you a Christian? You know, whatever manner of words that you use. Always ask them, how did they get saved. Did you see that pattern in the book of Acts? How did you get saved? How did you get saved? How did you get saved? <clears throat> Peter and Paul used that. Philip used that. All of you used that. How did you get saved? See, because many people have been a, a, approached and, and say they are saved because they joined the church or they was raised up in church and they feel they are bona fide Christians. Somebody say they're saved because they turned around the altar and began to speak in tongues, and the preacher told them that's the proof evidence that you are saved, but in reality, they are not. But they have, they have strong confidence that they are, and they will take that to their grave. Talking about Pentecostal holiness, you know, churches, people that believe in tarrying, speaking in tongues, and being baptized for salvation. They strongly tell you they are saved, and they will read their Bibles, they'll go to church faithfully, and they'll do all they can to please God, but in reality, when they die, they will stand before an angry God and be judged for their sin. You take people like Roman Catholic, a devout Baptist, a devout uh, Armenian, a devout uh, a Presbyterian, a, a devout Methodist or Lutheran, um, many feel that because they took the mass, because they uh, rolled the beads in their hands, prayed to Mary, uh, seen an image, seen a vision, heard voices talk to them, that they honestly feel that they are saved. And you have people, you listen on the social media, on TV, on the news, they admit, yes, I am a Catholic. Yes, I am a Pentecostal. And I know that I'm saved. But you see, you have to realize no one is truly, truly saved unless they have truly repented of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And the only way you can repent, the only way you can repent is by means that God has to regenerate both your heart and your mind, which regeneration is the changing of your heart and the mind, which was sinful and wicked and evil and depraved, rooted in sin. He has to change your heart and mind in order for you to receive truth. Once that happened, that's called born again or regeneration. When you do hear the truth upon God cleansing and changing your heart and mind from that sin we're born with, you can able to and able to reach out to God by faith and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I trust Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm wicked. I'm wretched. Save me. Only then that you are converted by the power of the Holy Spirit and you're declared righteous, that's justification. It's not in taking the mass. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed is the fruit of your womb. Many Catholics are holding on to that teaching on mass, believing in purgatory, uh, praying to the dead, beads, you know, the, the rosary and the beads on the cross. They roll it in their hands and they pray. They go to the church. They go in. As soon as they get inside the church, they bow and stand, you know, crucifix, holy, Mary, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Blessed is the fruit of thou. It's called the rosary. That cannot save you. But many are, many are taught by priests and noble priests, honest priests in their perspective, moral priests, and bishops and cardinals and popes and whoever in their religion that that's the means of salvation. And you see, the thing is that when we say, how did you get saved? They say, well, I got baptized. I got sprinkled. I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. I don't beat on my wife no more. I don't beat on my husband no more. I don't run around anymore. I don't get drunk. I don't go to the bar. I don't. I, I don't fornicate, adultery. I stopped sinning, which is impossible. <laughs> okay, which it is impossible. So, so, so you see, those are moral acts of human righteousness that people are told that's how you get justified. That's how you get saved. And you have a lot of people who are so moral and kind and good and honest for up to 80 years, 102 years, even 103, and they die, but not realizing that they died without Christ. And they will actually, on their deathbed, say, don't worry, daughter, don't worry, son, don't worry, mom, I'm going home to be with the Lord. I know I'm saved. But you have to challenge that. Mom, wait a minute. How did you get saved? Well, I went to the priest and what mom, stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mom, listen to me. Jesus Christ, Son of God, died on the cross for your sins. He loves you and he wants to forgive you your sin. You're a sinner, mom. Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now the moment she's dying now, but she's listening to that. Now, as he's saying that, she slumps over and dies. A devout Catholic for 96 years. This person has left this planet without Christ. See, that's why, it, that's why the doctrine of justification is the bombshell that the Roman Catholic Church hated Martin Luther and the Reformers because people were looking to the church and the pope for salvation. The same thing has happened today. People are looking to the church for salvation instead of Christ. People are looking towards baptism, <clears throat> Mary, the mass, sprinkling, stop smoking and drinking and tarrying and tongues and visions and whatever for salvation when you're justified alone by God. A lot of churches are preaching another gospel. But you see, another gospel, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, another gospel. Another gospel is so closely related and similar to the true gospel. How so? Because another gospel, when a preacher preaches another gospel, when a church preaches another gospel, they use the same language that you hear that I'm saying. They use the same language, justification. They use the same language, repentance, atonement, salvation, uh, be saved, born again. But their meaning to each of these sayings is different than the Bible meaning. See, that's the point. That's that's where it is called another gospel. Because it sounds like another gospel. It's worded like another gospel, but it's not the true gospel. It sounds like the true gospel. It's worded like the true gospel, but it's not the true gospel. And Satan has devised that, so he is very, very clever. 
He has over 6,000 and some years over mankind. And you can't outsmart and trick and fool him. He knows all of this. It's not that he's omniscient and all powerful and all knowing. No, only God is. But you can, you have to admit, after 6,000 years or so, you, you kind of know what's going on, right? All right. So he developed through, uh, he, he, he planned well because he said, well, I'm just using it as a, as a story here, that he probably thought, if I could only get rid of these apostles and apostles associates. So he broke out, as we was dealing with church history this morning, he broke out persecution that killed the apostles. Get rid of all the apostles, get rid of Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, and all that, which God allowed. All right? Persecution, tribulation. It began in the early church. So soon as all the apostles, the associates, and all that has died out, he started creeping into the church and he brought the world in the church. He immediately told the Caesars, that's Constantine in 313, hey, stop the persecution. Let the Christians come out. Let them come out of their catacombs, out of the mountain. Let them breathe. Let them come out and be associates and be part of the government. And so Christians did do that, and they began to mingle with the world, marry the things of the world. And that's how Constantine, the emperor of Rome, became the first pope both religiously and politically. All right, so therefore, you know that, so the church began to teach all this radical heresies and, and, and marry the mother of Jesus as far as she's co-savior, and Constantine brought out all that Babylon stuff and changed the names, and Christians were unaware of this. While they were preaching truth, true, in 313 and following, Satan was undermining it by allowing different religions and all that to infiltrate the church. And he, and he said, well, let's not harass the Christians. Let's just say, yes, there is justification, but justification is, well, it's by works. Yeah, it's by faith, but it's also by works. So the church grabbed hold of that, the Roman Catholic Church, some of the uh, Lutheran church at that time. Remember, after Martin Luther died, many of them that began to uh, follow Martin Luther called themselves mutterers, and then they start calling themselves Lutherans after Martin Luther. Then the same thing happened with John Calvin. When he died, the followers started calling themselves Calvinists. And that's how all these labels start popping up. So Satan, his diabolical scheme says, well, y'all getting too narrow-minded. Just lighten up a little bit and just let people come in and join the church and uh, shake hands with the preacher, jump over the broom and do all this. And uh, But just keep it just like the Roman Catholics started. You're saved by faith, but you got to work. So what the church did, they ignore our text today in Romans chapter 3. They ignore the scriptures and start saying, yeah, let's join the church. Let's build bigger churches. Let's, let's reorganize. Let's do this. And so we're at the point now in the 21st century, that's where we're at right now, the 21st century with all this structure and big stuff and, 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 and big congregation, and a lot of people are just not saved. Now, let's go back to our scripture here when it says justification is our faith alone. Because another gospel sounds like this. If the preacher who is a false preacher will get up and preach, he will say contradiction to what we're reading today. But he won't, he'll slice it up. He'll read what we read tonight, but he'll slice it up to please the Roman Catholic, the Pentecostals. You know, the Jehovah Witness, to please the Mormons, to please the, the Adventists. Let's not hurt them. They are our friends. They are our sisters and brothers in Christ. This is one of the most damnable, ridiculous phrases. How can you be a brother or sister in Christ and you deny salvation by grace alone? 
Well, we don't deny it. We know salvation by grace alone, but you got to work. No. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, let's look at it, verse 24, that you're justified alone by God's grace. Here it is. Being justified freely. See that word freely? It means by itself. Alone. No effort that you can make. You can't dream it. You can't say it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. Having been justified, declared righteous, freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you see on the board here, that's why I made the statement, I wrote, justification is the objective act of God whereby he alone declares a sinner righteous by means of the complete work of Christ. Any work that has to be done, it has already been done on the cross by Jesus Christ. That leaves no human being able to work. We're justified freely by his grace. Grace is the unmerited, unearned favor. We don't deserve it from God. We, I pulled out these words here, you see on the board, because we're going to look at them as we discuss justification. The first word is propitiation. Look at verse 25. Whom God, talking about Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. The word propitiation in this verse and many other verses carries the meaning to avert the wrath of God because God is angry with the wicked. Right? You see, when Jonathan Edwards preached that sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God, that's precisely what he's talking about. God had to save us from himself because God is God is God hates sin. He is furious. He doesn't pat sin on the back. He doesn't say, Oh, well, I'm gonna I'm give you one day to sin. He doesn't say, Well, it's okay. I, I, I you know, uh, no, God is furious. God is angry. That's what the word angry means furious highly displeased with the sinfulness of man. And that's why in the book of Psalms, it says God is angry with the wicked every day. Every step, the Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says every step you take brings you closer to death. And one of those steps is going to step you right into eternity of death, second death, wherein God will first call you back to be judge and sentence you to the second death. God here in verse 25 sent forth Jesus to avert his wrath from sinners. Those sinners are those who trust Jesus as Savior. Now, what does that mean? That means as a true believer in Christ, not an un upstanding citizen. We're not talking to you. We're not talking if you're moral, if you're kind and honest and, 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 and good in nature, because of many of people are. We're talking about those who have received an alien righteousness from Christ, the righteousness from God, by repentance and faith in him. You will never be chargeable to your sin, for your sin, ever. And that brings us to the second word, imputation. Imputation. Now, God not only saved us from the wrath to come, Jesus' death averted God's wrath on those who will repent of their sins. But what about you that do not repent of your sins, those who died in their sins? The wrath of God is upon all those 
who have died in their sins or who fail to repent of their sins upon his coming back the second time. Jesus Christ, Son of God, died on the cross to avert the wrath of God. But if you are truly saved, that wrath, that furious anger that God is going to release out on a wicked sinner, you as a believer in Christ will be spared from that. Imputation. Romans 4 Chapter 4, let's turn to that. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 8. So we turn one more page here to chapter 4 of Romans. The word imputation, the root word is impute. Another word is reckon. Another word in the English translation is counted. So let's read Romans chapter 4, verse 2 through 8. For it, for if Abraham was justified by words. He have wealth to glory, but not before God. Now, I think last week we sort of looked at this a little bit because many people say that in the church that there's some conflict between what Paul says here and in chapter 3 about being justified without works. A man is not justified by the deeds of the law versus what James says in James chapter 2. So put your finger there in, in our text, Romans chapter 4, and turn to, in the back of the book to the book of James. James is before he of uh, Peter. In James chapter 2, in James chapter 2, James is showing, is relating, James chapter 2, verse 17 and following, is relating to Genesis chapter 22, wherein Paul, in Romans chapter 3, when he talks about being justified, he's relating it to Genesis chapter 15. You get the picture. Why, why are the two separate? Genesis 15, Paul's saying about justification, how Abraham is justified. Genesis chapter 22, James is saying that's how Abraham was justified. Let's read what James says and you, you get the idea. Here it is, James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone. Now, you would, you would say, well, see, that's why the Roman Catholic, see, that's why they are confused. That's why the Pentecostals and many religions are confused, because they think in this scripture, it means you got to have faith and works. If you don't have faith and works, it's dead. But that's not what James is saying. See, what James is, is saying is that true faith Right? True, genuine faith produces good works, which is fruits and obedience to Christ. That's what James is saying here in verse 17. What do you say? Well, wait, I, I don't. What, let's read. Let's read. Even so, faith. Right? Now, I, you, you, you know, see, that's why you can't key in on one verse. Because, see, Scripture interprets Scripture. So, therefore, in order to fully understand it, you just can't go in the middle of a chapter and pull out verse 17. Oh, that's what it means. Faith and works is how you get saved. No, you got to go preceding. See, the Bible, the Scriptures in verse 14, it, it, it put, let's push back to verse 14. What does it profit my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, be careful now, because notice John, James is not stopping. He says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and one of you say to him, 
to them, depart in peace. Be ye warm and filled. Notwithstanding, you give not those things which they really need, but say, oh, God bless you. I'll pray for you. No, give them a can of beans and some hot dogs or give them something to eat or give them a pair of your shoes or give them some clothes or give them help them in whatever way you can if you're able. See, James is, is, is pulling a punch because there were people saying, I have genuine faith. What well, James says, well, I can't see your faith, but show me your faith by your works. See what I'm saying? So works follows true faith. I hope you see this. James says, what do we profit, my brother, if a man say, I have genuine faith? You're a Christian. You say, oh, I believe in Christ. I've been born again. I'm saved, and I'm, I'm living for Jesus. James says, okay, what if a situation comes in if a person is in need, or you're supposed to love that brother or sister, or you're supposed to have mercy or forgive a person, or you're supposed to help them and whatever? How true is your, how genuine is your faith if you don't reach more so past words and do something? James says that proves that you're really genuine in your faith. Now let's move on. Verse 15. Uh, we read that. Well, let's read it again. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily meats, and one of you says to them, Depart, be in peace. Be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it had not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, you have faith, and I have works. James says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now John doesn't pull any punches here. He, he, he moves on and says, you believe that there's one God. You do well. The devil, the demons believe and tremble. But will you, will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? See, that true Fiducia, the Greek word for genuine, true faith, is dead if works doesn't follow it. Works, see, let me, let me, let me illustrate this. The scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works. Works doesn't come before faith. Works doesn't come with faith. Works come after faith. So you, you follow me. Let me say that again. Works, the works doesn't come before faith. Works doesn't come with faith. Works comes after you have had faith. Those who have genuine faith in Jesus Christ do produce good faith by means of fruits and, and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter, here, James is going to give an example of what he's talking about. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father declared righteous by works? Wait, 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 James, you're confusing me, James. Paul just says you're not justified by works. Now, you're saying, Abraham, don't, see, don't just stop there. Listen to what James is saying. Was not Abraham declared righteous by works when he offered Isaac his son upon that? Now, here it is. James is saying this. In order for Abraham to prove that he believed God, he produced works. And what was the work that he produced? He offered his son. Remember what God said in Genesis chapter 22? He says, Abraham. Abraham, hold not, hold thine hand, lay not your hands upon your son. Now I know you love me. Now I know you are willing to give up your only begotten son. See that? That proved 
that Abraham had genuine faith because he believed God and he did something. But he didn't do anything till after he believed God. This is what James is saying. And then James says, so you see then, brother, you see then, brother, that faith without works is dead, James says. So you see then that faith without works is dead. Now, he keeps going. Let's keep on going reading what James is saying. Look at verse 22. See thou how faith worked with his works. See that? That is right there. See, that's the proof. The key word is you see. You can't see faith, but you can see works. And works follow genuine faith. For you to say, I'm a born again believer, I'm saved, and still living an adulterous, evil, wicked life still living like a man being a woman or still living like a woman being a man or vice versa still being a drunker a whoremonger and still practicing sin that's i ain't gonna do all the name calling but you're still practicing sin and then you get this give this great huge testimony in church james says you are a liar and the truth is not in you See, it's so easy to fool people in church and saying, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. But you see, James says you have to prove that you are a Christian by your good works, by your fruits, by your obedience to Jesus Christ. So you can stop slapping your wife around all you want and start loving her. That don't mean you're a Christian. You can stop smoking and drinking and partying and doing all evil stuff and wicked stuff and mean stuff, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. You can start going to church. You can start, you can get baptized, sprinkled, and, and turn over a new leaf, but that is not being saved. But I'm afraid a lot of people have been deceived in thinking that is the way. So James goes on. He says, wait a minute, I'm not finished yet. And the scriptures was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed. See, there's our word, imputation. It was imputed, reckoned, counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Here comes James again, verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? See, he's talking to those, see, He's not talking to a sinner that said, well, I'm not saved. And I'm... He's talking to those that, that say, oh, I'm a, a, a Christian. I'm saved. I'm born again. James says, okay, show me your faith. He said, what? Show me your faith. James said, do you have works? Do you, are you obedient to Jesus Christ? See, this is the reason why, and this is one thing why a lot of preachers is missing in their preaching and when they, when they declare the gospel. The scripture says repeatedly, 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 both in Acts and Romans, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Without the Lordship of Christ in your life, it is impossible for you to be saved because when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you make him the Lord of your life. When you go out and do whatever you want, you are commander of your life. You have, not, you have not repented. You have not yielded your life to God. That's why the scriptures throughout the book of Acts, even in Pauline's epistle, Paul's epistle, it says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God breaks, is always, the, when it comes to salvation, Paul says the Lord Jesus, because it's the Lordship. When you receive Christ as your Savior, Jesus Christ, who is Lord, takes over your life. You had a past Lord, a past master, which was Satan, using you, Romans chapter 6. But now, have, since you have been converted or has been changed, 
your Lord now saying, yield your members unto righteousness. Read Romans chapter 6 very carefully and slowly. See what I'm talking about. Then James closes it and says, he started talking about Rahab. Now, Rahab was a harlot inviting men into her home for sexual favors. That's how come she got that house and got all them wealthy stuff, and she had a family living with her. She was a harlot, prostitute, all right? And when the children of Israel came to Jericho to defeat it, two of the spies came into the house, and the Jerichoans or the people of Jericho and their army found out about it, and it was searching for them. Rahab believed the stories about the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and all that, you know, that she heard about it. And she knew that there was something different with the God of the Israelites. What she did was, if you, if I hide you, will you keep me and my family alive when you come and conquer Jericho? The two spies says, yes, tie this scarlet thread on your door. When we defeat Jericho, when we see this, we will not harm anybody inside that house. That brings us to verse 25. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messenger? See, she believed in God. A harlot, a Gentile. Matter of fact, if you trace her line, I don't know how it happened, but it came down to Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. They did something in there, but God allowed it. So the harlot, the harlot was justified. She was declared righteous by God. That's what it's talking about. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Genuine faith produces work. There's nothing disagreeable with Paul and James. Let's move on. All right? Back to Romans chapter five, uh, chapter 4. We're dealing with imputation. The word imputation means to be counted righteous. Not put, put to their charge. It's just like I'm, I go to the store and I take $200. And I say, I, I, I want to make a, a payment, and I want it so that if this such and such or such and such come in here and buy anything, give it to them, put it on my account. So here comes uh, Henry to the store, and, um, and he gets this and he gets that, and he pulls out his money. He says, well, how much? The man says, no charge. It's put to Sherman's account. He said, oh. Oh, okay. So that when it happened, when Jesus Christ, Son of God, died on the cross, he took our sins and put it on himself. Isaiah and Peter says, whom his own self bore our sins. Since Jesus bore our sins as believers, he charged, God charged our sins to Jesus on the cross. So the believer can never stand before a holy God and be charged for their sin. That's why the scripture says, there is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ. Why? Because Jesus imputates. The imputation of our sins was laid upon Jesus. Romans chapter 4 and, and here in the book of James. Let's read on. Romans chapter 4. Verse 4, now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. See, if you work, that means God owes you. You're kneeling down there at the altar, Terry. You're getting baptized. You speak. See, when you do a work, you're saying to God, see, Lord, I put money in the church. See, Lord, I'm getting baptized. See, Lord, I, I'm joining the church. See, Lord, I stopped smoking. See, Lord, I don't do this anymore. See, Lord, I'm back being a man where I used to be a woman. See, Lord, I changed my life. See, that's you owe me. That's what that verse means. God doesn't owe us anything. 
we all deserve the eternal judgment of God, which is the second death. But by his mercy, he saves some. All right, look at verse uh, five. But to him that works not, but believes on Christ that justified the ungodly, his faith is imputed. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David, I'm going to keep on reading, even as David also described the blessedness of the man. This is coming from Psalms 32. It says, Bless the, of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. This is recorded in Psalms 32. Now. It says, verse 7, Blessed are they whose sins or iniquity are forgiven, whose sins are covered. The word covered is an Old Testament word for atone. Atone. The scripture says in uh, uh, what is it? Leviticus um, 17, 11, life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it unto you for the atonement for your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement. There's no forgiveness. There's no remission. Bless, if you are saved, you are blessed. And that word doesn't carry, like people say, oh, bless you. God bless you. No, we ain't talking about that. We're talking about those who have re received Christ as Savior by faith. You have repented of your sins. You are blessed because the scripture says, blessed are they whose iniquity are forgiven, whose sins are covered. See, you will never face your sin. Now, suppose you live to see 96 years old. Let's go back in your time schedule to the age, well, 12. And from 12, you start doing horrible sins. There's seven days in a week. Each day you sin. That's seven days you sin. 30 days in a month, seven sins times 30. You counting with me? All right. Seven sins times 30. Right? Then you multiply that in a year, 365 days times seven. That's how many sins you committed in one year. Now you multiply that by 96. <laughs> That's how many sins you have to stand. I'm just using one sin. That's how many sins you got to give an account before God with, at the judgment being the judgment seat of God. But if you're saved, David says, your sins are forgiven, your sins are covered. They are atoned for because of Christ. All right? Read on. Verse 8. Bless is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. He will not ever charge you for your sin. Now, you know what you did back in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, those years before you got saved, right? And not only that, those sins that you're going to still do till you die, because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. So your sins from the past, the present, and the future has been forgiven because you have repented of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. No believer in Christ will face any amount of sin before the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and 1, Romans 8 and 1, really means what it says. There is therefore no judgment of your sin because of Christ Jesus. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. You will never be judged for your sins. Another word, let's quickly move on, reconciliation. When Christ comes into your life, the word reconciliation or reconcile means to be thoroughly changed. 
See, that one of the words that a lot of preachers are not using today is two of the words, repentance and conversion. When's the last time you heard somebody say convert, be converted, convert? All you hear people saying, believe Jesus, trust him as your Savior, accept Jesus Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll save you. Now, that scripture has nothing to do with salvation. But people are using it. The word reconciliation or the root word reconcile means to be convert, to be changed, to turn around. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. You are new. So I want you to look at that, chapter 5, verse 21, well, 17 and 21. Put it that way. Look at the next word, redemption. The root word is redeemed. And there's three Greek words that, that characterize the word redemption. Lutru, agorazo, and ex agorazo. Each one points about being a slave in the market. But the one that is very important, I mean, all of them are important. But the last one, ex agorazo, it confirms that you have been released from a slave market and never to be captured by your former slave master anymore. Ex agorazo, ex out of. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, Ephesians 1 and 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Look at the word, the last one, remission. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The word remission is an Old Testament word just like uh, uh, counted or reckoned or atoned. It means forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Galatians, I mean, excuse me, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. Our final thought here is justification does not involve works or the infusion of grace. Now, the reason why I put the word infusion because that's a Roman Catholic word. Because they, in, in the Roman Catholic system, they merge sanctification with justification because they can't believe when Martin Luther, John, when the reformer says that you are declared righteous by faith alone, they couldn't accept that. They say, no, you, you must work on becoming righteous. Once you become righteous, okay, once you become righteous, then you can work on being justified. That's why it takes, uh, as a Roman Catholic, many years, and you got to go through some seven things in order to become a saint. That's ridiculous. And I don't know how many Roman Catholics or some Lutherans they stick to that, but they're not called. See, when you when you join the Roman Catholic Church and become a Catholic, you, you, you're just that, a Catholic. You're a good Catholic, but you're not saved in the sense that you're justified fully until you, you don't become a saint. It, it sounds confusing, I know, wherein Paul says when you're saved, you are a saint. But you see, with this system, still going on even today since way back in AD 300, even today, you're not a saint because you got to see a vision, you got to see Mary, you got to experience a miracle, you got to, it's seven things. I, I mean, I'm going to look it up, but it's, it's, it's horrifying before you can become a saint. Then you're really not going to be called a saint by the Pope till you die. But yet, a lot of people will boast, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a, you know, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Lutheran, but, they, but they don't really know that they're really saved or not. They don't know because they haven't been told the true gospel. 
And this is why, as we close out, the reason why Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The truth has to be told. So we close out with our teaching on justification, one of these stones, and we're going to come back next week and look at the acrostic tulip, which helps us to realize that our humanity is rooted in sin. We are so corrupt, so wicked, so mean, so evil, God had to do something. He did. He sent Jesus. He came down and took a body like ours without sin and died on the cross. That's where we're going to pick it up next week in R.C. Sproul's book, What is Reformed Theology? with the scriptures saying that we're saved by grace through faith. And the only way you can be truly converted is to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as Savior. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of the word of God. We pray, Father, right now that those who are listening on the social media or any other way, that the Spirit of God will convict them of sin. He will convict them of righteousness. He will convict them of judgment. Move mightily by your Spirit, O God, and save that person before it's eternal too late. Strengthen believers to go out and proclaim the message of the gospel in its truthfulness, in its fullness, that people might be earnestly and honestly and genuinely saved. We give your name to praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this Sunday at 6.30, we'll have our, our, um, our sunrise service. At 6.30, we'll be dealing with opening with the book of Revelations, chapter 1. God bless. All right, guys. Everybody, God bless.